No matter how much evolutionists want to deny God, they can't even address the origins of the physical laws that govern our universe. To do so, they'd have to admit there is a creator, because you can't have laws without a lawmaker. When are these supposed scientists going to accept the fact that only creationism is completely consistent with physical laws? I had to investigate. Around the beginning of the 17th century, Galileo Galilei devised what would eventually be incorporated into the law of inertia. According to his student Vincenzo Viviani, he devised an experiment to test his own assertion that objects will fall at the same speed and acceleration regardless of weight. To do this, he would take two balls of the same material but of different masses and drop them from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If his assertion was correct, both balls would hit the ground at the very same time. Whether or not he actually performed this experiment is unknown. He never left behind any description of having performed it, but Stephen Stevenus is known to have performed it in the church tower in Delft in 1586. Several others have performed it using inclined planes. In all cases, this law was shown to be consistent, but not completely correct as factors such as wind, drag, and friction affected the outcome. Regardless of this, Sir Isaac Newton incorporated it into his Laws of Motion when publishing Principia Mathematica in 1687. The law was not fully tested, however, until 1971 when Apollo 15 astronaut David Scott performed the experiment on the surface of the moon. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather, in my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Because the moon has no significant atmosphere, both the hammer and feather experienced virtually no friction nor wind drag. This is an example of how scientific laws describe behavior only under ideal conditions, oftentimes in conditions we don't see here on Earth. This is why you're often told that the laws of thermodynamics refer to closed or isolated systems. It isn't that the laws are wrong, it's that the free flow of mass or energy in and out of a system offsets the laws. Boyle's law is referred to as an ideal gas law because it describes how gases behave under ideal conditions that rarely, if ever, exist. Like all ideal gas laws, it assumes that the gas being measured is composed of many randomly moving point particles whose only interactions are perfectly elastic collisions at standard temperature and pressure, much like a bunch of billiard balls on a table. It doesn't take into account the effect of other forces like electromagnetism, nor does it apply in excessively high or low temperatures. Physical laws are formulated by observation, measurement, and calculation. They differ from human laws by the fact that they merely describe how nature actually behaves with no regard to how it should behave, whereas human laws specifically prescribe how one should behave regardless of how one actually does behave. Although both terms derive from the Greek concept of physis, meaning nature, these are two completely separate concepts. The application of the term law to physical phenomena is fairly recent, being attributed to René Descartes in his 1633 treatise, The World, which described nature as matter itself. Thus, changes in parts are attributed to nature. As a colorful description, he dubbed the patterns in which we see these changes take place the laws of nature. A scientific law, in general, is merely an observed phenomenon for which no exception has been found. Additionally, a scientific law makes no attempt to explain why the observation holds. Explanations of why belong solely to scientific hypotheses and theories. While a theory can be used to calculate and predict future phenomena, it can never graduate into a law. A law is what happens, a theory explains why. In his book, The Grand Design, Stephen Hawking presented a subtle illustration of this by pointing out that we never see mile-wide spheres of gold, nor do we ever see mile-wide spheres of uranium. One could call these the law of mile-wide gold spheres and the law of mile-wide uranium spheres, but the law of mile-wide gold spheres will eventually be overturned as there is nothing preventing mile-wide gold spheres from existing. The law of mile-wide uranium spheres, however, will hold true as such a large sphere of uranium would be physically unstable. In this case, the law describes the phenomenon, 
but atomic theory explains why it holds true. If behavior conflicts with a human law, we force the behavior to change. If behavior conflicts with scientific law, the law is rejected. There is always the chance of apophenia with regard to any of these laws. Apophenia is the tendency to perceive connections and meaning between unrelated things. Occasionally, a physical law is overturned for this reason as more and more data is acquired. An example of this is Ptolemy's Law of Refraction, which was replaced by Snell's Law in 1580. A more recent example occurred in 2017 when a team led by Catriona Reynolds was able to effectively overturn a 100-year-old law on fluid dynamics known as Darcy's Extended Law. Nobody appealed to a cosmological governing board in either case. They merely noticed a more accurate pattern of behavior in the physical world. Again, just like a theory, a law is subject to revision or refutation. Physical laws describe properties. They do not dictate them. For example, particles attract other particles with a force which is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Gravitation is the tendency of massive objects to be drawn together. The law of gravitation describes how the force of gravity acts. It does not dictate how it acts. The theories of gravity offer explanations or models for why it acts the way it does. There are no rogue particles out there being kept in line because some law told them to. This is merely a property of the universe. Laws are essentially nature's behavior according to our understanding of it, and it is that understanding that actually has evolved over time and continues to do so. In a creationist model, due to its supernatural nature, scientific laws are notoriously subject to spurious exception. For example, the creation of the universe and time itself by a mere spoken word is a violation of physical laws as we understand them. The formation of the Earth in Walt Brown's hydroplate model requires a miracle to explain how the planet could be formed with a layer of granite encircling a layer of water encircling a layer of basalt in violation of nearly every physical law that has ever been formulated. If a law does not hold true at all times and in all places, it isn't a law and it has no scientific value. Whether or not there is a god, scientific laws are simply the consequences of fundamental forces. A better understanding of these patterns of behavior would be that understanding them allows us to better govern our own way through the universe. They are another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.